Hi everybody. Are we ready for part four? I know that I am. I have sure enjoyed these first three times, these first three sessions of this season, being of this series, being able to share about sheep and shepherd. Um, I know we have covered so much. Thank you for being kind to me about those extra minutes at the end. Um, I'm hoping that we will be able to just glean everything we can. I'm sure when I said that this was a series of seven, um, you all were like, seven about sheep? And now I'm sure some of you are saying, seven? <laughs> we have so much to get through and we only have four more sessions to do it in. <laughs> Let's pray so we can get started. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you, God, that you have so much to teach us. Thank you that you have called us your own. Let us see how beautiful that is today, of just knowing that, that you've called us. Um, Father, we love you and we thank you. Amen. Um, actually, I've got a little bit of air back, so um, I'm breathing a little bit better and my voice is a little bit stronger. And so hopefully we'll be able to keep plugging on. Um, I'm still hooked up to some hydration, so I think it might be helping. So let's keep going as long as we can. Um, if you're just joining us, we are on part four of a seven part series called a sheep series. We're learning everything we can about what God is, is, is saying to us about being a sheep. The whole, the whole premise of this wonderful year of studying together is, is, is to glean what we can out of the word about what he says we are who he says we are, what it means to be his. And, and we boiled it down to a lot of I am statements. God is saying to us that we are this. He says to us, I'm saying you are. And so just reading the Bible with this one lens, if I want to read the Bible, to pick up what I can about what he says about me has been a very adventurous year of study for me. Um, remember, I've, I've studied a year before doing this, and so it has been amazing to see how much the Bible says about us. And as we learn this together, it's all making so much more sense to me. Um, it's also become very clear that listening and putting so much emphasis on what other people say we are is really just a ridiculous waste of time. When God says all this stuff about us, we don't have time or attention to listen to what everybody else is saying about us. So I hope that that's going well for you as well. All right, so we've already covered the I am statements we've already covered is I am a shepherd. I am one and I have one. I am a sheep. I am one and I have one. I am a sheep among wolves. That wasn't very easy, but we finished it. And so today's is, I am in Christ's flock. Now that may seem to be redundant because we've talked about being his sheep and we've talked about him being our shepherd. But this goes even a little bit further, and we're, we're going to spend some time in the Word looking at um, the possessiveness, so to speak. Now, when we say possessive in, in, in our world, it, it, it has a bad connotation to it. It's like um, someone's trying to own you, you know, take over you. But there is a beauty of possession in the Bible. When you are owned, when you belong, to God. Um, it's just beautiful to see it. The other thing about this idea of being in Christ's flock, it also has to take us out of the realm of individuality. Up to this point, we've, we've really been talking about, you know, that I am a sheep, he is my shepherd, and that personal relationship. And we touched a little bit yesterday when we talked about that we are sent out as, as uh, sheep among wolves and that we're sent out in pairs. But today we have to see that 
being part of Jesus's flock all of a sudden opens us up that we now have to recognize that we are in a relationship with many other people while we are an individual sheep with an individual shepherd. So now we take our lenses, you know, God takes our, our eyesight and says, okay, you've been looking at you, you've been looking at me, you've been looking at the world, but now I need you to take the blinders off and see that there are other people in this same flock. There's a horrible, horrible message that has been going around the world and since I was a teenager. And I don't think we mean as Christians to give off this message, but we do. And we give everybody reason to believe it. I have heard it said so many times that Christians devour themselves. They eat their own young. And that's a disgusting thing to say, but, but what it boils down to is that Christians don't play well in the sandbox with other Christians. We may love the world, but we don't love each other. And we see that exercised a lot. And the media picks up on it and, and people pick up on it. How often is the church accused of being hypocritical? Um, by the way that we interact with each other. You know, the church just doesn't love each other well. And this is a part of this concept, is that we're moving from the beauty of just being a lone sheep with a lone shepherd into being one of many sheep with a shepherd. And our relationability, our, excuse me, our relatability with other people in the flock. Does that make sense? So it's just as important. We're still sheep, we still have the same shepherd, but now we're looking at the fact that we have other, other people around us that are loved by Jesus too. Okay, we are gonna start, once again, we're gonna, you know, some of the portions of scripture that we're pulling out are things that we've, we've looked at, we've become familiar, we're kind of dissecting them. So we are gonna start out at John chapter 10, okay? And we're gonna pull out a couple verses. And we've already looked at several, but we're just gonna pull out a couple and see how it relates to this idea of being a part of Jesus's flock. So we are gonna start at verse 14 through 18, um, and then we're gonna drop down to 29. Okay, here we go, starting at 14. I am the good shepherd, and I know my own, and my own, know me even as their father knows me and I know the father and I lay down my life for the sheep and I have other sheep okay listen to this I have other sheep which are not of this fold I must bring them also and they shall hear my voice and they shall become one flock with one shepherd for this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it again. No one has taken it away from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. I have the authority to lay it down, and I have the authority to take it back up. This commandment I received from my Father. And then verse 29, my Father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. Now, the reason that I pulled those verses out of John 10, because remember, John 10 is just full of sheep and shepherd, and, and we've gone through various different parts of John 10 already. But the reason that I pulled these out is because these make reference to the plurality, to this idea that a flock is not a singular word. Being a flock means you are a part of something and other people are a part of it with you. So you can't just sit as a Christ follower in self-awareness. No, as a Christ follower, he calls us to be aware of the others 
who are also Christ followers. And this isn't the first time that we have, we have looked at this concept of being in relationship with other Christians. Obviously, this is something God wants us to understand about who he's made us to be because he keeps repeating this. This whole idea that we are a plural people. Um, so let's look at some of these words. I love that we started, you know, in verse 11. We started in verse 11. You know, we, we covered verse 11 yesterday. But I want you to see what, what we can see different as we're looking at this idea that we are just part of a whole. Um, it says here that he lays down his life for the sheep. Now, we learned this in a singular form when we read this the other day about him being a shepherd. So we need to draw an inference. If we have come to the, to the, to the place where we have believed, you know, part one, I'm a sheep. Part two, I have a shepherd and am a shepherd. Part three, I am called to go places. Part of being a sheep is he sends me places. If we have been able to swallow all of those, then now we come to a hard swallow today. And this is, if, if Jesus laid down his life for me, in order for me to be his sheep, am I willing to look at other people with that same kind of awe? If he had to lay down his life for me to become his sheep, then we have to draw the conclusion that he had to lay down his life for all the other sheep as well. And if we are willing to understand and accept that and believe that, then we have to change the way that we look and the way that we value other Christians. You know, to have to understand personally, to just, to be able to just really truly, you know, fold into this beauty that Jesus, the Son of God, died for me. That's hard. But we can get there. But what do you think about this idea that that intimacy that he gives me and that overwhelming understanding how much he loves me. What are you going to do with that when you have to look at other people and say, Oh my goodness, Jesus died for him? Jesus died for her? That means that as we look at other people through this lens, their value has to change. We have to see them with the value of a Savior who died for them. With this understanding that the Son of God loves them. So suddenly we're not just looking at other believers like, oh yeah, there are other believers. We're looking at them through this lens of Jesus died for them. So we are not allowed to look any longer or to cheapen any longer the value of Christians around us. I'm not saying you have to like every Christian you meet. Christians aren't always the nicest people. In fact, I gotta be honest with you, I think some of the meanest people I've ever met in life have been Christians. Um, but despite that, they're Christians. We don't get to choose to not love Christians. We don't get to choose to not value other Christians. Now, I do believe that we have the choice to maybe not like them very much. But we have to come to the conclusion that their value and their place that they hold in the scheme of things is important. And they deserve that kind of honor and attention from another fellow Christian. Now, let's also, as we're in, in this portion of John 10, let's look down and see what it says. 
in verse 14. I love this. I think it's so cute. I know my own and my own know me. Now that is not a singular reference to my own. Um, I am a mom of, of many children. Um, I have, uh, I have two, I have a lot of kids. <laughs> I don't even want to count because some people get offended if they're not in the count. Uh, it, it, it's just a silly process. I have a lot of children, most of them being boys. And there is a singular way to say, oh, that son is my own. And there's a plural way to say them, those sons as a unit are my own. Okay. So that's what we are experiencing here in this grammatical setup of the scripture. This is not a singular my own. This is a plural, my own. So when he says that he, I know my own and my own know me, he's referring to us as a collective. God knows us not just individually, person to person, but he also knows us as a group. You know, we, we talked such a short time ago about what it meant to be um, I am named, and I and I and I talk to you about how important that our family takes the Frisch name. Um, the reason is because when you're known by your name, other people who have that same name are kind of lumped in with it. So it is so important to understand that when we are lumped in this group of Christians, that we are one of many. And that is important. And in knowing that we are one of many, there is a burden on us to get to know who we're in a flock with. We're not supposed to be loners in little flocks of one, 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 one. No. We are designed by God to be one of many. It's how he made us up. He wants us. He created us. He calls us a singular of a plural. And we're going to go deeper on that on another day. Probably not soon, but probably in the next couple months, about this idea of singular plural. That's what we're talking about today. Now, I want us to go and I want us to look. We're going we're gonna to quickly look at Isaiah chapter 40, and then we are going to spend time in Ezekiel. Unusual that we would go there, but I, I think you'll like it. We're just going to take a really quick look at Isaiah chapter 40, and we are going to look at verse 11. And it's such a sweet thing. And the reason we looked at, we're looking at it is because, again, it uses the word, uh, the plural uh, collective. Rather than one sheep, he's talking about the plural sheep. So that we get this understanding that we belong to a flock. Like a shepherd, he will tend his flock. In his arm, he will gather the lambs and carry them in his bosom. He will gently lead the nursing ewes. Okay. I so love this picture. Being a mom who has um, many kids, one of the things that I think my kids suffered, I think there's been some negative things about being from a big family. I, I think there's more positive than the negative, but, but there are some realistic negative things about being part of a big family, and my kids will be honest with you about them. But one of the things as a mom that I noticed was that I never seemed to have enough room on my lap. It, it always seemed like there was one more kid that needed to fit, and I didn't know where else to put one. I ran out of hands. I ran out of lap. Um, 
you know, the motto of our house has always been, you know, people have joked about it, but it is true. Our, our motto has always been, there's always room for one more. But the reality is, in the human world, we do run out of lap. And we do run out of hands to hold and arms to carry. But Jesus doesn't. So when we read this beautiful verse, we're seeing that, that this is in reference to Jesus. Like a shepherd, he will lead his flock, plural. In his arm, singular, he, singular, will gather the lambs, plural, and carry them, plural, in his, singular, bosom. He, singular, will gently lead the nursing ewes, plural. So you see, I'm sorry, there was a big bug. Ah, look! I'm not afraid of bugs, but this guy was just giant. Okay, sorry about that. Didn't want him to crawl on the computer. Do you see what we're seeing about this miraculous thing that we as humans, we really can't produce for ourselves? I pray that my children each felt that they were loved and that if they, if it wasn't, if they didn't get a spot at that moment on, on, on my lap, that they knew that they would get a chance on my lap. I pray you know, that, that was a very hard thing to figure out is how to hold more than three at a time and how to put on your lap more than five at a time. And luckily Aaron and I together made more hands and a bigger lap. So, but still in our physical being, we were always limited. But I want you to see that in this concept of understanding that he is calling us, you know, as part of a, a plural, he as the sovereign God Almighty, he as our Lord and Savior and Shepherd, they don't have the limitation that we do physically. They never run out of a lap. They never run out of room to be able to carry a sheep. They never run out of space. You know, my uh, I have twin grandkids, and they were adopted, so obviously their mom didn't get to breastfeed them, but we always used to, to, to tease, you know, how in the world are you going to be able to feed two kids if you have twins? And, and, and Jesus even takes care of that here through Isaiah, and he says, he even makes sure that all the lambs that are still nursing have enough. This is a beautiful promise in, in Isaiah chapter 40. He, he's helping us understand that what we can't do in our humanness, what we can't even comprehend in our humanness, God makes up for. Jesus makes up for in their deity. As hard as it is to understand this concept of being part of a plural, we have the assurance that no matter how big the plural gets, everyone is still tended. Everyone is still gathered in an arm. We're all still carried and that we're carried close to his heart and that he has enough nourishment for every single one of us who are hungry. Do you see this beauty coming out in Isaiah chapter 40? The promise that we have that no matter how big Jesus's flock gets, it doesn't lessen our individual time and nurturing with Jesus. It's like this amazing a supernatural mathematic equation that, that doesn't work. You know, if you only have this amount and you have this, 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 many things to pour this limited amount in, well, it only seems to reason that you're not going to fill them all. And you're not going to fill them all even near being full. But in God's design, it doesn't 
matter how many belong to him, he always has enough to pour into all the way up to the top every single one of us. Now that's a beauty. That's a promise. We are not going to be left out. I am sorry to tell you that as a mom, my children have complained in different times that they felt like they were replaced or that they had to quickly grow up because the next one was coming under. And those are some of the you know, the, the consequences that were bad from being a big family. But according to Jesus' formula, that will never be a problem. Never. He has enough, no matter how big the plural gets. Now let's go to Ezekiel 34. Now I am going to ask you, please, please go look at this yourself. This chapter, you do not want to miss this chapter. Again, I'm going to show it to you just so you have this overall view. I, I shared with you that I, I color and I, um, I mark things so that my mind can remember them. Well, in every single thing that God says, I mark in yellow in my Bible. So that when I look at my Bible, I know if I see yellow, it's directly coming out of God's mouth, whether it be through a prophet or a bush, you know, whatever, whatever it is, if it's God speaking himself, it's in yellow. And then I, I try to make little symbols in my Bible so that if I see them, it'll, it'll jog a memory. I'm going to show you what Isaiah 34 looks like. Okay, can you see? This is Isaiah 34. Can you see how many shepherd hooks are in there? And can you see how much of that is yellow? That's the chapter that we're going to cover right now. And what does that mean? That means that God is speaking every single word out of his own words through Ezekiel to us. And how many shepherd hooks did you see? A ton. So this entire chapter is all about this idea of being a singular in a plural flock and still feeling that personal con personal connection with your shepherd. Now, I am going to try to read this really quickly, 1 through 16. I am going to ask you when you go and do your work, I want you to read the whole thing and I want you to take it apart word by word and phrase by phrase and verse by verse. And as I had talked about earlier, you know, if you get all the worksheets together, you're going to not have to repeat work. You're just going to keep adding to what you're learning. Okay, I'm going to read fast and I'm asking you to follow along. Then the word of the Lord came to me. That's Ezekiel speaking. He is saying that God's word, God is now going to be speaking out of his mouth in first person. So we're going to hear first person. When it says I, it means God. And we are going to see that God is giving a message to his people and it's beautiful. Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to those shepherds, thus says the Lord God, Woe, shepherds of Israel, you have been feeding yourselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flock? You eat the fat and clothe yourself with the wool that you slaughter the fat sheep without feeding the flock. Those who are sickly you have not strengthened. The diseased you have not healed. The broken you have not bound up. The scattered you have not brought back. Nor have you sought for the lost. But with force and severity you have dominated them. They were scattered for lack of a shepherd. And they became food for every beast of the field and were scattered. My flock wandered through all the mountains and on every high hill. And my flock was scattered over all the surface of the earth. And there was no one to seek for them. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As I live, declares the Lord, surely because my flock has become a prey, 
My flock has even become food for all the beasts of the field for lack of a shepherd. And my shepherds did not search for my flock, but rather the shepherds fed themselves and did not feed my flock. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of God, Behold, I am against the shepherds, and I shall demand my sheep from them, and make them cease from feeding sheep. So the shepherds will not feed themselves any more, but I shall deliver my flock from their mouth, and they may not be food for them. For thus says the Lord God, Behold, I myself will search for my sheep and seek them out. As a shepherd cares for his herd in the day when he is among his scattered sheep, so I will care for my sheep and will deliver them from all the places to which they were scattered on a cloudy and gloomy day. And I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries and bring them to their own land. I will feed them on the mountains of Israel, by the streams and in the inhabited places of the land. I will feed them in a good pasture, and their grazing ground will be on a mountain height of Israel. There they will lie down in good grazing ground. See familiar language here? They will feed in rich pastures, and on the mountains of Israel. I will feed my flock, and I will lead them to rest, declares the Lord. I will seek the lost, bring back the, sh the scattered, bind up the broken, and strengthen the sick. But the fat and the strong I will destroy and feed with my judgment. Now, it, it keeps going on, and, and we might look at the rest of that chapter in one of our other parts of the series. But I want you to see that the, the, this first part of Ezekiel 34 is, is kind of split in two. In the first part, God is speaking directly to the people who he has left in charge of his people. And, and I, I'm so sorry to say this. Pastors, leaders, elders, people who have any kind of authority or responsibility for God's sheep no matter how many or how few, you are called to a higher standard. These first, this first half of these 16 verses is a reprimand. And it is a mean, harsh, strong reprimand. God is saying, all of you that were supposed to care about the other sheep, you have made a mess of the other sheep. You've starved them, you've taken advantage of them, you let them die off, you let them get lost, you let them scattered. He is reprimanding, he is reprimanding the church for not paying attention, taking care of the sheep. So when it says that we are part of his flock, he is explaining here that his flock and the care of his flock, the people that are his, the people that belong to him, we are responsible for. And if we are not doing a good job, then God is not, is not happy with our performance. So, when we have studied this, you know, this individual relationship as a sheep and a shepherd, it's different. But now studying this plural and, and how deep that God expects us to go in being caretakers of one another, being in roles of leadership and of teaching and of preaching and of gathering and of feeding and defending fellow Christians, Man, he is telling them how awful of a job they are, that they're do awful of a job that they're doing. Now, I know it's going to be hard, but when you do your homework today, I want you to list all the things that God is complaining that the shepherds aren't doing right, because that reprimand is for you and I. 
We need to be aware of how we are taking care of other Christians around us. Are we letting them get scattered? Are we starving them? Are we taking advantage of some of them? God's ticked and he does not couch his words. He lets us know that he takes this seriously. He makes it so clear that us as a whole, Christians as a whole, are so responsible to one another. Now, the good part of this is the last bit of these first 16 verses tells us how he does it. So he doesn't just say, naughty, naughty, no, 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 that's not how you do it. He goes back and he reviews and says, look at the way I do it and try it like this. So I am ending you with this. I know we're not ending on this woohoo note, but we are ending it on a such intense note of knowing that the I am statement, I am part of his flock, means that we are not just taking the privilege of being one of his, but we are accepting the plural of being responsible for the flock. Okay? Make sense? We're going to keep going further. We're going to keep going further. So happy studying and I'll see you tomorrow.